Becca McCall and I'm the Director of Annual Giving Programs here at Roberts. And I am here today to tell you about our Day of Giving coming up on March 24th. Um, hopefully this sounds familiar to some of you. It's a day that we have every year. Um, we set, a set aside 24 hours where we try and raise as much money as we can for you, for our students. Um, whether you know it or not, Many of you are here today because of the financial support of alumni and friends of the college. Last year they gave over $1.5 million that helped support you with your scholarships, your programs, your activities, which make your education possible. So we want to celebrate that and we want you to be part of that day with us. One way you can get involved is by sharing our video that we're going to be posting that day on social media. You can go to the Roberts social media pages and share that video. Maybe you want to put in there about how Roberts has made an impact on your life and how you're grateful for the scholarships and support that you have received while you're here. Maybe you could take it one step further and you ask your family or your friends to make a gift that day. Or you can get involved in a trivia competition we're having that day, March 24th at noon. Um, this is going to be a competition between our student experience funds that are listed here on the screen. Um, so if you're part or of any of these groups or participate in any of these things, you might care to join us that day because this, the fund or the team that wins trivia gets $500 towards their fund, and the fund or the team that has the most attendance gets $500 for their fund. So we'd love to have you join us. You can go to roberts.edu slash trivia competition to check that out. We hope one way or another you'll join us that day um, and celebrate how Roberts alumni and friends are making a difference in your life every day. ago a friend of mine said it's either the first week of March coming up or it's the 53rd week of March depending on how you're counting right of course it is March 2020 is the month that will not end I remember that month so well I remember driving across the city one day I was listening to the news on the radio and they were talking about this virus and it was in Italy, and all of northern Italy was shutting down. And then the next day, all of Italy was shutting down. And I started thinking, well, that seems strange, but it was still pretty far away. And then I came to a meeting, and we started talking about what if we had to shut down. And that was on March 10th. And March 11th, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. And March 20th, the state of New York started to shut down. And on March 22nd, I still remember, I was driving across the city to my office to pick up my plants. And I, I had to kind of convince myself, it was a Sunday afternoon, I had to convince myself it was worth it, right? Like, I sometimes forget to water them anyway. They'll, they'll survive a couple of weeks without me. Well, Five months later, I returned to my office. You have your March 2020 story, we all do. And then the story of all the months after March 2020. For a year, we've played guessing games with what will be open or closed, and will the hand sanitizer I need be available at Wegmans? Will I be able to go visit my family? Will they be able to come visit me? What do the travel restrictions mean? I mean, will I end up in quarantine? Raise your hand if you've spent one day at least in quarantine over the last year. Everybody? Yeah, that's what I thought. Just kidding, I don't know if you raised your hand because I'm here in a room by myself filming. This is our new normal, <laughs> but we would really love at some point, right, to get back to something that resembles the old normal. A lot of things have bothered me in the last year, but one really petty thing has bothered me, and I'm just going to own it. 
We continue to, I continue to hear this being referred to as these unprecedented times. I know, I know, it's, it shouldn't really bother me, but it does. My friends have heard me sort of rant about our use of the word unprecedented many times. If you look to history, actually what you'll find out is these aren't very unprecedented times. History class matters, friends, you should pay attention. What, what people mean when they say that is we're in, in uncharted waters for us. We have to make decisions every day that we don't really know what to do with. And, and new information is coming out all the time and we're having to sort of make adjustments as we go. And all that is really true. But it doesn't mean that we're without precedent. If you Google history of pandemics, you'll actually see this really interesting infographic that tells you about all the pandemics that have happened sort of through recorded history. And then of course there's all the ones that are in unrecorded history as well. But it shows you the scope and magnitude of what pandemics have done in the history of, of the world. But more than the fact that pandemics have happened, so there is some kind of precedent for the world that we're in, I look actually at the history of the Christian response to some of these things to try to understand what precedent is for me. What does it mean for me to live through a global pandemic? Well, I, I look back at history and say, what did it mean for others? There are actually historical documents and letters and histories that tell us how Christians responded, especially in the second and third centuries when different epidemics were happening in their communities. And in the midst of these plagues, Christians remembered that God was there. Just like all year we've been remembering that God is here. So what did that mean for them? Well, by understanding that, I think it can help me to understand what it means for me. So at that time, when there was less knowledge about diseases and how they spread, there were many, many, many deaths in some of these early pandemics. And as soon as someone was sick, they would sometimes be left out in the street to fend for themselves, sort of cast the sickness away from us. There are stories of physicians that would desert cities so that they uh, wouldn't put themselves at risk. But Christians didn't do that, not for the most part, not according to history. Christians would actually take the sick into their communities. They would care for them. And a lot of the evidence is sort of, they would give them food and water. And more of those who were cared for lived. So there was this sense, as people were watching, there was this sense that God was with them, right? And that this was some kind of miracle that was happening. And here's the deal. I believe in miracles. I also believe that you know, providing care for people who are sick leads to better health outcomes. And in some way, that's the story of the early Christians, right? In the midst of the pandemic, they did what they could to care for their neighbors. And it led to more people being healed from disease. And the watching world took note and said, God is with them. They did not fear because God was with them. And that led them to offer care and compassion to others. So I think about that today when I think about this pandemic. What am I called to do? Well, what I learned from the precedent of the early church is that I'm called to um, take care of my neighbors to the best of my abilities. So I'm not in the health professions. If you're in the health professions, it might mean for you that you're actually caring for people. For me, it really means like, I'm wearing a mask and taking hand sanitizer with me places and taking groceries to people that have more trouble getting out than I do. And I also think that these early Christians and their response was an act of witness. I think that's an important part that we need to remember. We say God is here and that is true. God is here. But the way we live that truth is what makes it meaningful to our community and our neighbors. 
And sometimes it means that we are the presence of God to them. What the early Christians did to take care of one another and their neighbors who had been abandoned was a witness that God was present in the community. The care they had for one another made them a healing community of witness to a God who heals. People could see that God was there because they saw Christians showing up. You know, COVID-19 is one pandemic that has changed our lives and our world over the last year. But I would suggest it's probably not the only pandemic we need to be paying attention to. I had you Google history of pandemics. I could have had you Google history of extreme poverty, history of racism and genocide, history of violence against women, history of slavery and human trafficking. Those two are pandemics in our world. Those are going to require more than random testing and wearing a mask and getting a vaccine. But we are no less called to respond to these pandemics. What would it look like in these instances as well to be a community of healing for the world? What would it look like to be witnesses to God's healing presence, God's reconciling work? God loves the world and is present with us in it. How will we respond? How will we show the world that not only God is here, but God cares and God heals? You know, in the last book of the Bible, in almost the last scene of the story God is telling, we're told about a city and there's a river that runs through the city and a tree. And it says the, tr the leaves of that tree are for the healing of the nations. It is the city of God and it is a symbol that is meant to give us hope in the present. The place where we are made to live is a place where we are healed and made whole. To say God is here is to live into that symbol, to speak a healing word to the world and to be the presence of God as we care for one another. Mm -hmm.